Hello, and welcome to At the Helm, Captains of Constitution. Thank you for joining the USS Constitution Museum today for our presentation, a wonderful conversation with former commanding officers of USS Constitution. It is a terrific opportunity to hear from the captains of America's ship of state. It is my privilege my name is Ann Grimes, President and CEO of the USS Constitution Museum, and I have had the honor of working here in the Charlestown Navy Yard with these wonderful folks in command of Constitution. And today, we had hoped to be joined by Commander Mike Beck, who sailed Constitution in 1997 for her 200th anniversary, but duty calls, and I'm afraid we may not have Mike joining us today. I'm going to turn the program over to our current commanding officer, and that is Commander John Benda, 76th in command of Constitution, who is joining us today from on board Old Ironsides. So John, I'm gonna turn it over to you to facilitate this conversation. All right, thank you very much, Ann. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with the USS Constitution Museum again and joining forces and collaborating and tell stories and promote our great ship. It's a privilege and an honor to be online here with two former commanding officers. Uh, I hope there may be some former commanding officers tuning in and watching the panel today. Not sure, but hopefully there are. But I know coming to you from the captain's cabin here on board America's ship of state that I am surrounded by the spirits of many former commanding officers that are passed on before us, including the greats Isaac Hall, William Bainbridge, Charles Stewart, Stephen Decatur, so this is the perfect place to start off uh, and, and do this panel today. So first off, I would like to ask 71st in command, Captain Tim Cooper, to quickly uh, introduce yourself and tell us where you're coming from today. Uh, thanks. Thanks, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Captain Tim Cooper, and uh, I was the 71st commanding officer of, uh, of Old Ironsides. I was privileged to have command of that uh, wonderful ship uh, from July 2009 to July 2011. Uh, been in the Navy for about 29 years, got another year or so uh, left to go. Um, and after I left Old Ironsides, I was privileged to command the, the main Maritime Academy Naval ROTC unit. And today I'm calling you from Newport, Rhode Island, where I'm currently serving as the executive officer of the Naval Leadership and Ethics Center. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, I'd like to ask 72nd in command, Captain Matt Bonner, to do the same. Good afternoon, sir. Hey, thanks, Sean. Uh, my name is uh, Captain Matt Bonner, uh, born and raised in New York and uh, Meredith, New Hampshire. Uh, I had command of Constitution from July of 2011 to July of 2013. Uh, and after that, I went on to command uh, Maritime Prepositioning Ship Squadron 2 out in Diego Garcia. Uh, I'm calling today from uh, Huntingtown, Maryland, where I live, uh, and I recently retired from the Navy after 28 years of service. So looking forward to today's conversation. Thank you, sir. Uh, late breaking news. Uh, I think we may have Commander Beck online with us. Are you there, sir? <clears throat> I'm here. All right. Outstanding. Great. Sir, can you, uh, can you tell Captain. us where you're... Uh, we can, oh, there we go. How you doing, sir? Could you tell us where you're coming from today? I'm actually uh, speaking to you from Virginia. Uh, I have uh, I'm the head of school in uh, of Dunn School in Los Olivos, California. Five days after I uh, left command of USS Constitution, uh, almost 23 years ago, I uh, became a seventh grade history teacher and. Uh, that evolved into being head of school. And that's what I've been the last 13 years at the Dunn School in Los Olivos, California. I'm married to Maura Beck and uh, Maura and I've been married for 37 years and we have two children, Matthew, who's in the Navy SEALs. Meredith uh, and Matthew's married and has one child and Meredith is, uh, her and she's <laughs> and she has one child she's married to a coast guard lawyer and meredith is a nurse practitioner here in norfolk virginia so it's i'm delighted to be with you this afternoon outstanding it's a pleasure to have you online sir 
Um, if I, I could start with you, Commander Beck, um, and just <laughs> ask a, a very simply stated but probably very difficult question to answer about what Constitution means to you, Constitution Command the ship. Constitution represents not only the values and ideals of the Naval Service, but to me, the values and ideals of the nation, uh, commitment, honor, courage, these are essential elements that are necessary, in my opinion, of every citizen as we, in our search for freedom, as, as a nation. I feel the same way, sir. Um, for me, uh, Constitution Command is, is, is very personal. I, I feel the weight of the Navy on me as one of the faces of the Navy and, and the half a million visitors that we have to our decks that potentially have never met anyone in uniform or uh, in, the, in the sailors as well. Uh, Captain Bonner, same to you. What do you how was your uh, personal connection to the ship? It was a pleasure to see you retire after 28 years of service here just a few weeks ago, and you made the decision to come back to Constitution Command as the place to hold that ceremony. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, for all of us, uh, you know, the ship is a special place. Uh, when I was going through the pipeline, uh, one of the other former commanders said, you know, the ship speaks to you. And at the time, I, I kind of thought he was a little, you know, crazy about it. Uh, but I found during my time there, that the ship is special. Um, it's just one of those places where uh, you know, obviously we've had heroic people that have served on it, uh, but the mission of the ship, you know, from the time it was launched and, and what it meant to this nation, um, it is special. And every time you go back there, you just kind of get this feeling. Uh, I know when I was in command and I had one of those bad days, uh, I'd take a walk on the ship and, and miraculously, whatever problem I was dealing with uh, sort of be became clearer. Uh, and so when it came time to retire, I couldn't think of a better place to end my career than a place that meant so much to me both on a professional and a personal way. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, Cam Cooper, uh, first I'm jealous. I think I saw you get to throw out the first pitch in one of the pictures. Uh, maybe someday uh, I'll get to do that. Um, some of the, uh, the, the former COs like the Captain Hulls, the Bainbridges, Hull has a reputation of being more of a, a sailors type leader. Um, very big on training the crew. Bainbridge had the reputation of being more the taskmaster and maybe disliked. And Stewart, the reputation of being very great tactical mariner. And they probably were all a combination of that. There's many different types of leadership. And, and with your position at Navy Leadership and Ethics School, where every commanding officer and every command master chief needs to go there to learn a thing or two, what can you tell us about what makes a good commanding officer in the Navy and a little bit about your style? All right. Well, that's a that's a, a, a really, I guess, loaded question. Um, but I, I think I would start with this. You know, leadership, I think, is situational to a large extent. You know, every every level of um, uh, that we journey through as we make our way up the Navy's ladder, uh, we encounter new circumstances, new people, new missions, uh, uh, new obligations uh, and restrictions and whatnot. And the leadership that we all need to to bring to bear needs to take all of those things into account. And as uh, you, you know, and, and to say that I think, to say that there is you know, one sort of leadership style that will make you more successful than another, uh, I, I don't know is, it would be a correct statement. Um, and so for me, I think, you know, the first thing that any officer, any commanding officer certainly needs to do is, is to be able to assess you know, what they have been entrusted with, um, you know, from the, you know, the condition of, of the ship all the way down to uh, the sailors uh, that, that make up the crew. Uh, and then from there, you know, develop, uh, develop a, a way to blend all of those things together to accomplish whatever mission you've been assigned. You know, and for me, I, I hope that's the, the type of leadership I've I have one to develop over, um, you know, over my 21 years of service. Commander Beck, could you comment Tim, on I think that that's a great yeah. answer. And, and I'd just like, no, I'd just like to step in because I think Tim's answer is 
I, I don't, you know, I've, I now have a doctorate in strategic leadership and I'm proud to have achieved that, but I've really been studying leadership for 50 years. And I think there, you're exactly right, Tim, there is no one definition, but I think that there's an yes in leadership. We all need to understand that by our example, we, we set, uh, we, 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 for others to follow. And uh, I think it's really important whether you're a parent or the leader of a ship or of any organization uh, or just as a, as a friend, as an example, uh, that you are setting the example for others to follow. They're watching, watching you. Uh, I, one of the things that's really occurred to me in the last few years is that parents have one of the most difficult leadership there is because they were preparing future citizens for their role in, in our nation's his, uh, future. Uh, just a tremendous responsibility. But with that said, um, I think that understanding that leadership is, needs, to, if you're the leader of an organization or a family, you need to recognize the importance of your values and these values should be become shared values. Uh, uh, we, I talked about courage, honor, and commitment. Those are the Navy's values. If, the, if those are your values, you, you should uh, embody those. You should set the example for those values. Uh, and a shared value system is something that uh, you need to talk about and, and live by. If you, if you are truly committed to a set of values, uh, uh, other people need to know the values. And in the civilian organizations and in families, people join in and say, I, I want to follow those values. I want to understand those values. The other thing, and I think it's really important uh, just in, in this concept of leadership is creating a shared vision. Uh, one of the things that in command of constitution that was interesting, it was very interesting putting a vision in place that uh, was to, to represent America. This was in 1997 when we sailed for the first time in 116 years. The interesting thing that occurred is that and that I presented as why we were sailing the ship was to represent uh, America sailing into the 21st century. And that idea uh, was, meant one thing to me, but it meant another thing to a person in Chicago or a person in California or uh, a part of New York dead or a part of the crew. And each person had their own understanding of what that idea of uh, the context of America sailing into the 21st century. So this idea of shared vision is the other point I'd like to make on, on this question. Uh, and a, a wonderful question. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, which kind of goes right into my, my next question, which I think, Commander Beck, uh, we all uh, look to you as the person who got to sail the ship after 116 years. And uh, I do have some follow-ups for Matt about sailing. But I, I guess we just assume, or I just assume, that that was the pinnacle of your, your tour. And it very well may have been, but there may have been very uh, uh, many other successes. So I guess I'll just ask, what was your favorite moment in command? You know, upon reflection, the, my favorite mo moment was when Walter Cronkite, I, when we took the ship under sail, uh, it was asking Mr. Cronkite if he wanted to take the helm. Of course he said yes. Uh, <laughs> and at the moment that he took the helm, the Blue Angels threw, flew overhead, and uh, it was a wonderful culmination of, of an event. But I think what is most important, and I think of the museum staff in this role, uh, what was most memorable to me, the values, um, that a local person uh, in the Boston, Heron Ellenson in Boston, who was our public relations person, hired by the National Park Service, Heron said, you should take the money for, from Coca-Cola to buy the sales and the running rigging to make this happen. And uh, I think it was Anne or Marguerite Daisy uh, 
uh, Ann Rand, who's the president ch chair of the Constitution Museum now, uh, they weren't in those roles at the time, but uh, they talked about a pennies campaign. And what we did was we actually executed a pennies campaign, which is what uh, saved the ship back in the 1930s. And I hate to go on here, but it's an important story because we didn't have permission to sail Constitution. Uh, and I was ordered to uh, visit the Pentagon and Vice Admiral Gaiman, who was the uh, uh, making the ship or giving me permission to sail the ship, uh, called me into his office. And uh, I, I was uh, quite impressed and uh, stunned by his question. <laughs> the process started this way, Captain. He said, Mike, I cannot say because of all the different things that had happened in the Navy, uh, you guys have done great work up there, but uh, tail a chain scandal at the Naval Academy, but he fell from the mast and died. And I understood mm -hmm. what Admiral Gaiman was looking at. And, and I just asked a simple question and I didn't know it at the time, but this is what the result was. I, what I asked the question, what do we do with a half of peace that we've raised, raised from school children all over the country? So we had spent two years collecting these pennies in barrels on the pier. And it was Stephen Honickman, who was uh, in essence, the attorney general of the Navy. And Mr. Hon Admiral Gaiman looked at Mr. Honickman and Mr. Honickman, did this with his shoulders, just kind of like, I don't know. I don't know what you, what the answer is. And then Admiral Gaiman suddenly, he, ch he, ch he changed his, uh, he changed his approach to me and looked at me with great seriousness and, and, and was stern. And he said, okay, Mike, sail the ship, but do it safely. <laughs> and uh, th that's, uh, that's how it happened. And that was just uh, about three months before the actual sale occurred. Fantastic. But uh, uh, if we had used if we used different values, uh, the ship would have never never sailed. Better to ask for forgiveness than permission. And you, I, what I was told is you had gone so far into the training that it was hard to turn back. And it's it's uh, the strategic vision that you talked about sailing that ship for the first time in in 116 years. Now, uh, Captain Bonner, you have the privilege of being the captain, the only captain to also sail her since 1881. And, and this question is maybe a little more technical, but don't stay on this if you don't want to, but just about how you get a crew ready to set sail. How, how, how much training does it take to, to get them ready? So when I took command in, in July of 11, you know, Tim had, had, had kind of set some things in motion, uh, got the ship rigged again and had kind of planted the seed in my head to sail in 2012 uh, to honor the 200th anniversary of Constitution's victory over Guerriere. Uh, and so we kind of started working through the plan with our sail masters um, of, of training the crew, getting familiar with doing up and over, doing regular sail training, but then also looking at what the manpower would be to actually raise the sails. Uh, I think you know, everybody will tell you that the main topsail is about 4,000 pounds, requires about 60 to 70 sailors. You've got a crew of 75, how do you make that work? Uh, and so we looked at, at Chief Heritage Weeks as the perfect time to do that. One, because it coincided with Gary Air. Um, and then I had 120 to 150 free bodies uh, that I could use for, for horsepower on the deck while using the, the sailors up in the rig. Um, so we kind of executed that plan right away. Uh, the next part of the plan was, was as you said, you know, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is permission. Um, so, you know, the Naval Sea Systems Command obviously gets a vote. Um, people are very protective. So they paid me a visit. Um, <laughs> I said, here are, you know, their automatic response was no. And I said, well, I believe these are your concerns based on the stuff that Mike had done in 97 uh, and some of the stuff that Chris Melhuish had done in 98. And said, as I understand it, these are the concerns. Here's my plan to mitigate them. And they kind of sat there and were like, darn, he's actually applied some thought to this. Um, and I was very lucky. I had a director of the Navy staff, uh, Vice Admiral John Bird, and then Vice Admiral Rick Hunt, who supported us. 
Uh, and once NAVC came up and they witnessed the training, saw how we did things, uh, they gave their final blessings. And so we announced that about two to three weeks before we actually executed to sort of, you know, build up some suspense for that. Uh, and then, of course, uh, much like, you know, Mike coming on the heels of the cheating scandal, our, our sale came on the heels of uh, Porter's collision in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. um, but all you watched on ABC, all the major news networks that night was Constitution under sale. Um, and that, you know, again, it's it's the work the predecessors before me had done that enabled us to kind of see what the, you know, how we do this safely without endangering the ship, but also not keeping it encased in this plastic bubble where it doesn't do anything. Definitely. And, uh, you know, coming into this job, I think we all think I'm going to be the, the next one to, to sail the ship. And it doesn't really always work out that way. Uh, the, the crew is willing and I am willing. And I think I could even convince a few admirals to be willing. Uh, but that 224 year old ship needs constant maintenance and attention to, to stay and uh, presentation ready, promotion ready, be America's ship of state and and, uh, and and to be capable of sailing. She's very close and I think she will be again very soon. Um, but there's also many other high points to being Constitution Command besides just sailing. Um, so Captain Cooper, could you tell us about maybe some of the pre-work that you had to do to set Matt up for success to get all the glory uh, and then some other high points? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's re really, I think I gave Matt the idea and, and that was about it you know besides trying to beg to stay there a year longer so i could actually do it um which obviously failed uh you know the the, the thing the thing like mac said is is that it, it is a bit of a challenge when you don't have the manning necessary uh, to safely sail the ship on our own and then trying to figure out where do you get a a trained core of of disciplined folks that are familiar with at least you know, naval procedure uh, to some level that you can uh, use. And I think Matt's uh, idea to uh, uh, use the, the chief petty officer selectees that come up to Boston uh, every, every August uh, was a genius one. And uh, it, it took a lot, it, from my you know, perspective, uh, it took a lot of the uncertainty about the training program uh, away from uh, away from, you know, the Navy, you know, that right. those concerns go away. Um, but, you know, just like I think everyone here, I had, I certainly had some, uh, some highlights uh, during my time uh, in command. And uh, the, the one that I, that sticks out to me the most uh, uh, was the day that I got to have my daughter christened on board. Um, you know, to me, you know, my family, my, my awesome wife and, and, and my incredible daughter um, uh, and the ship are, are probably the you know the three things I, I think that are the um, most important things to me. And uh, oh yeah, there's her name on the on, on the plaque in the captain's cabin. Uh, so when I think back to the good moments that I had there, the first one that pops to mind, uh, you know, was was that day. And you know, uh, my sailors uh, that were there were awesome. You know, they helped me set it up. You know, and, and you know, bringing the, the, the ship's bell and putting it in the bat, you know, turning it upside down so we could use it as a baptismal font uh, and doing all of those things uh, just made that day um, even more special than it would have been uh, without uh, Constitution and involved. I know what you feel about that, sir. It was uh, uh, I baptized my son Teddy on board the ship as well. He shares a place on the bulkhead with your daughter. Um, I know you gentlemen know this, but anyone watching. I did have uh, some advantage over uh, the former commanding officers here. I got the opportunity to be the ship's second in command before I then fleeted up to be 76 commanding officer. And I got to tell you that I thought I had it wired. I thought that this tour was going to be easy. We we're going to sail this ship. I have so much knowledge already before day one that uh, I'm going to be able to do great things. The change of command was on February 29th. And then March 14th, this thing called COVID hit. And I thought it'll be over by Easter. We'll be back in business. Of course, we all know that didn't happen. Um, so definitely COVID will, will become what I would call my greatest challenge uh, in my command tour. 
and the greatest successes are still coming. But the, I would like to ask each of you if there was one great challenge that you just didn't see coming. I'll start with you, Commander Beck. Um, uh, that that uh, it's not all pomp and circumstance all the time being in command of Constitution. Maybe you could just touch on something like that. Yeah, it, it's a great question. Thank you, John. I, I have uh, a, a very distinct memory. You know, you said, uh, go ahead and uh, take action and uh, suffer the, the consequences. Uh, I had, uh, when I decided to, to sail, it was because of Charlie Deans, who was the director of the, the Naval Historic Debt in Boston at the time. And I said, Charlie just completed a five-year overhaul uh, under the command of Rick Amaral, who did a, an amazing job getting the ship ready to sail. But Charlie, I asked for my change of command, I said, Charlie, was there, is there a, the potential to sail the ship again? And Charlie said in the limited fashion, and what he meant is between five to 15 knots of wind in a sea state uh, lower than two. And in any case, uh, once I made this uh, a part of my change of command speech uh, and said the ship will sail again on June, July 24th in 1997, I actually gave a date. Uh, I then realized that, that I had to do it. And the interesting thing that occurred was I, I closed the ship to all tours. I called up my boss in Washington and I said, all, this, all the, the entire crew is now flying to Mayport, Florida to get on the Bark Eagle. And uh, I asked them each, uh, this was Dr. Bill Dudley and he was the director of Naval History at the time. And I said, Dr. Dudley, uh, they're all gonna write to me to s tell me whether they think we can sail Constitution again or not. And we had men and women on the crew and uh, a very diverse group of people like there is now, uh, and all really were trained to be tour guides uh, because of their presence and, and good speaking ability. Um, it, they, they all came back uh, from this uh, 10 day at ocean, uh, in ocean cruise on the Bark Eagle and they gave me a, a letter uh, that, they, that I asked them to write. And they, they said, yes, captain, uh, we believe we can sail Constitution again, and uh, we want to do it. Uh, the interesting part about that is once they all decided that they wanted to do it, then it became a reality. And uh, <laughs> I had no idea, honestly, other than sailing a 12-foot dinghy at the Naval Academy when I was a student there. I had no idea how to sail, so I had to learn how to sail. 72, can you tell us about any challenges that just took – took you uh, off guard in command? I, I think there were probably two. Um, one was, you know, getting funding for the dry docking because uh, mm -hmm. obviously the dry dock belongs to the park service. Uh, and so how do you, um, and obviously they don't have as much money as DOD, just a, a, a you know, a reality of, of how things are funded. Uh, so making sure that things were in place to enable the ship to go back into dry dock in, in 15 uh, the second challenge was one that no one saw was the Boston Marathon bombing. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, since 9-11 and, and coal and all those different things, you know, the Navy has a pretty strong thing on force protection. Um, but obviously, Constitution has sort of a different mission. You know, we're open to the public. Um, and so during my time there, you know, we worked with the Park Service and the Navy region down in Norfolk on how to modify our, our conditions as the threat changed. Um, and, and we had literally just gone through the Navy's annual <clears throat> force protection exercise about a, a month before the bombing happened. Um, so again, obviously, you know, a lot of young sailors in the crew, um, and on that day of the bombing, uh, myself, the ops officer, who's our force protection officer and our former XO were all on the course running the marathon. Um, no. and when, uh, I finally got back to the ship courtesy of the state police, um, everything in our AT plan had been executed by the crew. You know, junior sailors, people who, you know, they, they'd only gone through the training recently and it was like they had had months to prepare for it because everything was done the way it was. Um, and it was, it was, you know, it was a challenge explaining to people not in Boston, the environment at that time of, 
you know, a city sort of on edge. Um, but watching the crew and how they responded and, and the partnership with the Park Service uh, and the maintenance attachment that, that moved things around for us, um, you know, no one ever expects to have that happen in their command tour. And, you know, luckily, by the grace of God, no one was hurt, you know, from the crew, because uh, normally we have people that are volunteering. Uh, so everybody was accounted for, ship was safe, crew was safe, all those things that as a CO, you, you're concerned about. Right. I think we'd probably all agree that we have the best sailors in the fleet here stationed on Constitution. It, it's a real rigorous uh, uh, criteria that it takes to become a Constitution sailor. Oh. Besides uh, the physical fitness required to get up in the rigging, you got to have a love of history and you have to have the personality to be able to tell the story of old Ironsides. Um, I think I'm probably the only CO now that really gets to hand pick each and every one of their sailors and uh, the sailors and being in command of sailors is what uh, truly special about uh, being in command of the Navy. And uh, Tim, I, I was wondering, uh, do you have contact with former sailors of yours? I know that Matt had some at his change of command and I'm in, in, in contact with some former Constitution sailors and planning a reunion in, in October. But when you get a crew card, you're a crew member of life. It, people really mean it, don't they, sir? Oh yeah, um, you know I, I am lucky to, to to have kept in contact with with several of the folks I I served with up in Boston, and um, you know the relationships that you form there um, I, I think will last a lifetime. You know beyond it's just it's beyond what you see uh, in the rest of the Navy. You know you're what 70, 80 folks uh, up with you know the the oldest commissioned war ship afloat in the world, the Navy's only sailing ship. Uh, you're somewhat alone and, and unafraid in, in, in that great city. Uh, and, and so I think when, when you consider what you're doing um, and who you have as resources around you uh, to do it with, uh, you naturally become a little bit closer. Um, but, but just since I've left there, you know, I've had uh, you know, some of those men and women who I, I worked with you know, reach out to me asking for uh, letters of recommendation for different things, you know, whether it be a civilian job or something within the Navy. Um, and it's just, it's just phenomenal to watch them to continue to grow. And it's a quite the honor, I think, to, to know that they still value me, you know, by asking my, you know, from my name on a, on a letter that's going to go into their package for whatever. And it all came to, you know, just recently, um, uh, since I've been here in Newport, you know, one of those former sailors, uh, and, and Matt helped me out with this, you know, we interviewed him uh, to become an officer. Uh, he went through the officer candidate school. And my first couple of weeks there at NLEC, I got invited to watch him uh, be commissioned as an ensign a couple of buildings over from where I'm sitting right now. And, and yeah. it's that sort of thing that just really, really, I think, and, um, makes, makes me value my time and my association with those awesome men and women that much more. So we, uh, we recruit, um, there are um, consequences of becoming a Constitution sailor when you come out of boot camp. Some of these sailors are choosing uh, to not be promoted for two years in order to come here because of the way uh, you need to go to A school in certain rates to become promoted. And they still wanna come because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity that not many people can say that they have been a crew member of Constitution. And certainly not many people can say that they have been a former commanding officer of USS Constitution. There's only been 75 former commanding officers. For, for those that you don't know, I affectionately call them the FOCOs, a, a organization of former COs, and they are invaluable to me. And they are the only ones that know exactly what I'm going through and, and, and the first person that I call when when I need assistance. My, my very first interaction with a FOCO was Commander Robert Gillen, 59th in command, Charlestown native, who had come around all the time and uh, appreciated his candor in telling my predecessor, Commander Schick, uh, what the XO and what he could be doing uh, better. And it was much appreciated. Thank you, 59. But um, so the FOCO group, uh, is something that I hope to join and be invited into maybe someday if I'm lucky. But could you just talk about, uh, start with you, uh, Matt, 
as kind of taking over the, the lead FOCO uh, for the time being, uh, what the FOCOs meant to you then and what they mean to you now. I mean that only uh, 71, that he's responsible for planning the, the July 4th event. You might have made your entering to this club a little harder there, John. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks for that, John. Um, now, the, the FOCOs are, you know, I always say it's, it's a brotherhood or, you know, and hopefully at some point, you know, uh, include a sister in that. Um, but, you know, unlike, you know, commanding a gray hall in Norfolk or San Diego, where you can go talk to your buddy across the pier, uh, you, you allude to it. There, there's no one that understands the unique aspects of that job because it is different. Uh, you know, you're a, a DOD asset in a national park. You have a, a very interesting wiring diagram in terms of who you work for and then who you work with. Um, and there's always stuff that comes up that, uh, you know, just, you know, you can ask guys that are you know, in command of a gray hall and they'll be like, yeah, I, I can't help you with that. Um, and so that relationship with the former commanders, I think, is invaluable because they are a sounding board of, you know, when, when you have something come up and go, hey, did you guys ever deal with this? Oh yeah, hang on a second. I might have something in my files, um, and and again, they've they've been there and done that, um, and I think that. But you know, we have that shared love and respect of the ship, um, and you know, I think at times, you know, especially for the current CO, uh, you know, we're not trying to relive glory days. It's it's really just hey, we're here for as a resource to help you, because um, we want to see you join our club. You know, at some point, although you know, Tim may vote you down when that comes up, but. You still have my thumbs up, John. You're good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tim, would you would you mind commenting? Um, you, you know, so uh, I appreciate what you said about Bob Gillen. Uh, first of all, I mean, he was a you know a very interesting man uh, and one who I don't think any anyone who knew him uh, can uh, say that he did not love that ship. Uh, and that's where his interests were founded or his, his efforts, energies were, were put forward to. Um, and he was my, uh, uh, he was one of my first, like really involved introductions uh, to the FOCOs. I mean, I'd met, I'd been privileged to meet uh, 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 Mike's successor actually down in Norfolk uh, before I got up to Boston. But um, that, that whole, you know, that whole group of men, uh, you know, really help uh, with all the unique um, unique experiences you have up there, the oddities, and frankly, just the opportunity to pick up the phone and vent about, you know, the, 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 the struggles that you face up there, the challenges that you face uh, to somebody who's going to not only understand what you're saying, but might, might actually uh, have had that same experience before uh, you, it, I don't think you can understand it. And so, um, you know, I'm very happy, uh, very lucky, very privileged, I guess, to be a member of this group. Uh, and it all started with with Bob deciding that, you know, this, this was something that, that he wanted to, to put some time and energy into. Commander Beck, I wonder um, the some of the former CEOs, if it was that way when you were in command, uh, you know, 20 years your senior, if, if they were so approachable the way that I'm lucky that I have all of you to uh, be my sounding board. Captain, it's a good question. It's a good question. And the answer is yes. Uh, uh, the FOCO organization existed. And uh, I have to comment on Bob Gillen because uh, Bob, uh, when, when he was actually against the sale when it first was proposed. And, and what I di did, if you did, you, many of you don't know Bob Gillen, uh, Bob's passed away, but uh, one of the things that Bob uh, was always doing was figuring out how to make the ship better. I mean, that, that was his focus. And uh, in the process of sailing the ship and in the process of the pennies campaign, I asked Bob, I said, Bob, I have a really important job I need you to do. I need you to collect the pennies uh, uh, and give them to the bank in Charleston that agreed to put all the pennies in, in uh, coin rolls and collect the, a half a million dollars worth of pennies, quite frankly. So Bob, every morning, would come in with his car, and he had permission to drive 
up to the ship, uh, which at the time didn't have a security fence around it. <laughs> and uh, he drove to the ship and he, he simply uh, loaded up all the pennies. He did that for two years. And so I figured out, uh, you know, it was a real blessing because the pennies campaign worked because of Bob and uh, his energy put to that. Uh, you know, you talked about, about uh, how, how do you get to the ship? And, you know, one of the things that uh, even back in 1995 that I was interested in was first the crew and and had the same strength and ability as men to climb. And I learned that as uh, we sent the, the crew down to the Bark Eagle to, to sail and continuing that sail training process. I think one of the interesting things that I had the opportunity to do to ask Navy for uh, a black senior chief who uh, became the first sailing master, African-American sailing master of the ship. And uh, he did an amazing job. Now, the important thing about uh, the master and then executive officer, the first female executive officer who was Claire, Claire Bloom, um, a very interesting thing that occurred is these people, it wasn't about having diversity for the sake of diversity. Both of these people were the most qualified people to do these jobs at the time for them because of that competence and uh, that ability. And so it wasn't because of their uh, race or because who they were and their competency that they were selected. And I, I just think that uh, anyone here listening, if they're looking at trying to you know, position or any position that uh, it might be uh, something they're seeking, become competent in it in a way that you're demonstrating that in your <laughs> performance. Thank you. Uh, we are gonna jump and take some live questions uh, an anonymous uh, writer wrote, in your opinion, what's the biggest takeaway every visitor should have after visiting the ship? Tim. Can I, can I answer that one? All right. Please. So first of all, uh, this is a couple part answer. First of all, the ship is not a museum ship. It is an active <laughs> ship commissioned into our Navy. Um, and the sailors that are assigned there are not reenactors. Uh, they are actual modern day U.S. Navy sailors who have a very unique mission. Uh, they're not tour guides, they're sailors. And when you come and visit this ship, uh, while you get a tour of the ship, what you are truly getting exposed to is not only our Navy's history, the foundings of our Navy uh, and uh, uh, some very unique moments as relate to the ship, but you're also getting an opportunity to interact with some of the best men and women uh, that I've ever encountered in, in my time in the Navy. And if you walk away from this experience, uh, uh, you know, knowing a little bit more about the Navy, but maybe even knowing a little bit more about the men and women that make up our Navy, uh, I think you have, uh, you have hit you know, all the highlights that you can possibly hit from your time, uh, time on that ship. But and uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so I feel the same way. You know, the, the fact that we see so many people cross our decks, tourists and uh, um, foreign visitors, we are likely the only person in uniform that uh, most Americans will ever meet, which is crazy to think that, but probably true. And we take that very seriously that we're representing the men and women uh, across the fleets, across the world right now and make sure that we're representing them properly. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, I got a, uh, another question about the career path of a USS Constitution sailor or an, an officer. Um, if you're interested in joining Constitution Crew, contact your special mission detailer. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're uh, looking for the best and brightest of the Navy's uh, enlisted corps and chief corps and officer corps. Uh, come on out. It is way more busy and challenging than you think, but it's even more fun than you think that we're having. So I encourage any of our active duty service members interested in joining Constitution Crew to, to, to jump at that chance if offered. Um, 
Thank you, Jim Little, for the uh, congratulations. Questions are coming in. Oh, thank you for uh, this one, uh, anonymous uh, attendee. Let's let's turn turn it around and and jump all the way back uh, twenty plus years and talk about why you joined the Navy. Now, I think my dad's online. Hi, Dad. Love you. Uh, dad was enlisted in the Navy, and, and Grandpa was enlisted in the Navy, and you know, very early, I, I knew that I was going to do Navy something and was lucky enough to, uh, to do ROTC and get my commission through the College of the Holy Cross. Um, what inspired you gentlemen to, to join the United States Navy? Start with uh, uh, Tim, uh, Tim, please. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I was a bit of a, a, a lost soul as I was working my way through, through high school. Um, uh, I like to think I was a smart person, but I was, I was somewhat lazy, didn't, you know, unfocused. Uh, and my dad, who I also saw in here, you know, hi, dad. Uh, his um, his kind of, you know, thing to me was you need to go to college, you need to get a job. You know, you're not going to sit around like a lazy lump on a couch. Um, and so long story, uh, to make a longer, uh, long story somewhat short, uh, I, I found myself at Mass Maritime Academy uh, on Buzzards Bay. And as I was there, uh, you know, starting to get exposed to, you know, the Mariner's life, uh, I found myself uh, in my junior year uh, selected to go uh, work as like an internship uh, for the Military Sea Lift Command. Uh, the ship I was assigned to uh, was, uh, I met her in Rota, Spain, and all of a sudden uh, was sent over to the Red Sea to support Operation Desert Storm, Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Uh, so, you know, while I was in college, my mom, you know, my mom's trying to figure this out. She's paying for me to go to school. And here I am ending up in a combat zone, um, you know, working with the Navy. And it was there that I realized that, you know what, I, this was something I wanted to be to be part of. And so I, I had been working my way towards getting a reserve commission into the strategic sea lift officer program. Uh, and I at that point, when I got when I got back to Buzzards Bay, I decided to change my focus and, and pursue an active duty commission as a, as a surface warfare officer. Um, so that, that's how I ended up in the Navy. And uh, just coincidentally, the ship that I was assigned to that was sent to the Red Sea, uh, its name, or her name, was the USMS Joshua Humphreys. Uh, nice. Anyone who's <laughs> uh, you know, uh, unaware of who Joshua Humphreys was, uh, he was the designer of Constitution. You know, kind of a, a unique Very cool. um, circle that's kind of formed in my career. Yeah. Um, Commander Beck, did, did you have a, qu uh, a question direct to you that you'd like to answer? Yeah, uh, Alan uh, Wyman wrote a question uh, with regard to uh, many people think of the Constitution as a revolutionary warship, but wasn't it actually in the War of 1812, which is hardly ever talked about? Uh, Alan, it's a, it's a great question, and you're right. And I think that um, what I'd like to do is to just quickly, as a history teacher, provide a quick context, uh, one minute. Um, if you look at the Revolutionary War and you think of, the, let's say, the Boston Massacre, uh, Bunker Hill, uh, the, the Battle of Lexington, what you're thinking about in, are physical interactions between the early American founders, citizens, and British forces. And these, you, this eruption of, of citizens is causing uh, America to talk about separating from England and seeking its own status as a nation. That, that was the representation of freedom of the land. That's what I'd like to think about it. What constitution represented in the War of 1812, which was really the result of impressment of ships and sailors by the British Navy, which was the greatest naval force in the world, uh, what it really represents if you dissect freedom of the sea and all the trade that occurs in the world, uh, the majority of the trade that has ever occurred in the, the world occurs uh, on, in, the, in the ocean and on the sea. On the sea line. You're my two-year-old daughter or granddaughter running by. by. <laughs> She's, uh, she'll be number 90 someday, 90th in command. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, Captain Bonner, uh, we had a question from Jim Hall, and he asked about 
uh, the importance of a, a senior enlisted leader. Uh, and uh, I'll just spread that out to the importance of a, 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 a good triad. Uh, how important was that to you and the success of your command, sir? Uh, it was invaluable. I think, you know, as the captain, you know, there's, there's so much stuff you have to do. Uh, and, and a triad is good because, um, you know, I was blessed with a really, with two really good XOs and two really great uh, command senior chiefs. Um, you know, the first one that I inherited from Tim uh, and the second one that I got to pick. Um, but they were good in making sure that, you know, uh, sometimes people have this impression that the captain is always right. Um, and mine were really good at occasionally being the devil's advocate of, uh, as we discussed, you know, policy changes, whatever the case may be, uh, you know, whenever the good idea fairy poked its head up. Um, but we balanced each other out. And one of the things that I, I told them on day one was they could never be afraid to come in and, and give me bad news or tell me that I was wrong. Um, I think that's one of the things in command is, you know, you're not infallible. Um, and that, you know, I always made it a point of as you look in, as you listen to, you know, the great leaders that we all, you know, studied in, in various places was, you know, a lot of times in meetings, I kept my mouth shut as we had a discussion around the table, because oftentimes, sometimes the best idea comes from the most junior person in the room. Uh, and a lot of times, if the senior guy opens his mouth, all original thought stops. Um, so to have, you know, a senior enlisted that, that could give you the pulse of the crew, because, um, you know, everybody wants, always wants to paint a great picture for the captain, but they're the ones that'll tell you how your policies are being, you know, understood on the deck plates. And like I said, I was blessed with two really great ones and two really good XOs that sort of, you know, had my back, but also could, I could confide in when I needed to, you know, vent about stuff of, you know, something in D.C. that was driving me nuts. Great triad on Constitution right there. Now, shout out to uh, my XO, Lieutenant Commander Broyles, and Command Senior Chief Angela Collins and former Master Chief uh, Valdespo. Um, fun question. Usually every time I do a, a open forum or a tour, someone asks me about the, where they went to the bathroom. Um, but not that one. A little bit different. What's your favorite deck? And this question comes from Eli. What's your favorite deck of the ship? Let's start with Commander Beck. I would have to be the 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 keel, and uh, where the keel represents the foundation of the ship and base uh, uh, that Joshua Humphreys probably spent a lot of time thinking about how to design it, and uh, it, what what happened on that uh, space was. Uh, a revolution in technology and, and the number of guns that the ship actually carries above, above that deck is a result of what happens in that keel area with diagonal riders uh, changing the vector and forces of uh, the uh, she's a lot of Royal Navy ships uh, because of that design. Uh, what I like to call the stealth technology of the day, maybe now it's uh, the, 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 the Elon Vance or Musk. Uh, Elon Musk. <laughs> he was the Elon of the day. Um, we don't take many people down to the Orloff deck to see the diagonal riders and see the keel. We do on occasion get to take people to the F magazine to see the keelsome and, and some of the, the cross beams. Uh, I'll just, my, my favorite area is the captain's cabin, the quarter gallery where the captain at least went to the head and it's a nice place to escape and enjoy the scenery and, and uh, kind of be Captain Hull for a little bit and think about what he may have been thinking about. How about you, uh, 72? Uh, for me, it's a toss up. I, I always love the gun deck, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just, uh, just seeing, you know, the, the long guns uh, sitting ready to go. Uh, and obviously the captain's cabin's right there. So much like you always enjoy that. Um, but for me also the spar deck. Uh, you know, that's where the cat would be underway. Uh, you know, you true, you, you really get a, a, a vision of, of the ship and the rigging uh, and how much is involved in that. Uh, and I just, I've always enjoyed that. It's the, you know, it's, it's one of those places you can walk around and, and just spend so much time just admiring how that place was put, you know, that ship was put together. 71, you get. Yeah. <laughs> I like the spar deck. Um, but I, I like the view from uh, you know up on the rigging though. Um, Matt, Matt and I have a, an awesome picture of the day that uh, he relieved me, uh, taken from 
uh, the fighting tops looking down on our ceremony. And it's one of my favorite pictures of the, of the ship, other than the event that was occurring, which is not one of my favorite moments. Um, you know, I wanted to stay longer. The, uh, the underway that we just did without people on board, uh, I actually got the chance to climb the main fighting top underway for the first time. Uh, and I've been here for a couple of years now. So that it, it's, it's very cool being up there when the ship is moving through the water. So I'm glad it, silver lining of not having guests, I get to go up there. Um, I hope Anne's not trying to give me the hook, but uh, maybe we should just look for, for, for one more question. Um, I mentioned in my remarks at, uh, at Captain, Captain Bonner's retirement about the uniform and the weight of the uniform um, and joked about the heat of the uniform, but the, but that question about the uniform, it's uh, really apparent when you put it on the importance of your job because you are literally the only person authorized in the United States Navy to wear it. It's a ceremonial uniform set in the 1812 period. The crew and I uh, get the privilege of putting it on and representing that era sailor. Uh, and it's fun. And it is fun to wear. Thank you for that question. Um, any... Uh, a question about uh, what can an American citizen do for the Navy? And, and that's a loaded question, but any thoughts on uh, what uh, people visiting the ship can do for the United States Navy? Difficult question to ask. I'll take it. Yeah, please do. I think the biggest thing is, is understanding the importance of the Navy, um, you know, and, and letting their representatives know, you know, we are America's away team. That has been the, the mantra of the U.S. Navy since its founding. You know, we, the whole part of having two oceans is, you know, we've never, you know, we, the Navy is the one that takes the fight to the enemy. Uh, and we've done that throughout our history. Um, you know, the, the globe is covered, you know, 70% by water. Um, as I say, you know, we've always kept the sea lanes free, not just for ourselves, but for the global, you know, good. Uh, and without a U.S. Navy, that's not necessarily guaranteed because I think everybody will tell you nature abhors a vacuum. And if the U.S. <laughs> Navy is not there, some other Navy might be. Right. And they may not be as open in his understanding. So I think that's one of the things that people need to understand that, you know, that's what the Navy does. It's not, you know, it's, it's an important thing. And, you know, we, we've been doing the same thing for 200 and, you know, 30 plus years. Um, it's, it's not always sexy, but it's important. And I think people need to understand that and let their representatives know. And is trying to give I mean, I got to get this one question in and I hope this doesn't cost me entry into the, the FOCOs. Uh, the next the decade is, is a really special one for the ship and for the country. The 250th anniversary of the, the Revolutionary War, which we weren't a part of, but, but we represent uh, the uh, second war for independence over 1812. There's an opportunity to really shine in, in the, the 250th anniversary and, and also the 100th anniversary of the National Cruise, which many people have no idea about, including your captain before he got here at Constitution. Would you be in favor of stretching the legs of Constitution, maybe for a very well controlled uh, and secure out of Boston port visit, maybe in honor of the world's cruise? Please, Mike Beck. Captain, National Cap Cap Captain, I'd like to take a shot at that. Yeah, I'd, I'd like do. to take a shot at that. I, uh, first to propose that the ship uh, get under sail again with the idea not not specifically uh, the sail but where it should go and he said mike you should go to marblehead harbor and uh revisit marblehead which during the great escape constitution as uh, went into marblehead harbor uh for refuge and it was an amazing event for the citizens of not only uh, Head, but Massachusetts and those who observed around the world. Um, I think that Constitution will, by, by doing this kind of national cruise under controlled conditions, you said, and doing it safely, uh, can really bring a whole spirit to our nation that, that it needs right now. It's in that, that spirit is about unity. It's about coming together and understanding what brings us what draws us together as a nation and as a people. And uh, I think Constitution represents that in a, in a profound way. Thank you, sir. 
71. Everyone's going to get a chance to, to answer this one. All right. So I, I think in general principle, yes. I mean, the ship, the ships are meant to, to, to go places, right? And while her home should always be Boston uh, for, you know, for her history and her time and service in that port, uh, I, I think I agree with, with Mike that, you know, taking her to various parts of our country to help uh, share, share the Navy's history, uh, getting, uh, allowing people to meet the great men and women that uh, serve aboard Constitution, I, I think is something that should be, you know, seriously considered. Uh, it does need to be weighed against the risk of something happening to uh, a national treasure. Um, but I think, you know, done properly and done with a lot of forethought, I think she's, I, I think she's, uh, she is in a condition to go. Captain Bonner, sir, final word. Uh, I'm going to sort of disagree with my, my two brothers there. <laughs> uh, I do want to see her under sail again. And I think, you know, there are places, you know, within distance of, of Boston that you could probably go to. Uh, I think the risk, uh, again, like Tim said, weighing the risk, because uh, as we all know, as great as our weather models are, how often are our weathermen correct? Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, that's those are the things that I think about, of, you know, especially having lost bounty uh, and other mm -hmm. things of uh, how do you how do you weigh those two things? But I think, you know, there are opportunities to maybe do something close by where you have support. Um, but, you know, the people in Marblehead were annoyed when I told them that we probably wouldn't come back because force protection requirements require clearing out that entire harbor. Uh, so, <laughs> Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure and an honor to speak with you, as always. Thank you very much for your time and for your candor. And uh, signing off here, turning it over to President of the Museum, Ann Graham Friend. Let me echo the thanks for a wonderful conversation from the keel of Constitution to the tip of the masts, the leadership insights, the stealth technology, past, present, and future of this ship. It's a privilege for the museum to share the stories of Constitution to work with all of you. And I want to thank you for participating in our panel today. I also need to thank the Institute of Museum and Library Services, which is the funder of our salute to service effort. And at the museum that is enabling us to run these virtual panels to help share the stories of service aboard Constitution, to work with the ship's crew, with their families and with veterans who have served far and wide. So my thanks to all of you and my thanks to the audience because many of you in the audience have been strong supporters of the museum during this year as we gather virtually. I'm pleased to report that as of today, the museum is now open seven days a week. So for those of you within striking distance of Boston, we welcome you back live in person, but we appreciate the virtual support as well. I have to report on Friday, USA Today named the museum one of the top five history museums in the country. And that is thanks to all of our friends and family who voted online in their Reader's Choice poll. So that is all of you who are here with us today. So I thank you for joining us. There will be a follow-up survey because we welcome your input on future conversations we might have. So please participate in the survey. And thank you again for joining us virtually. We look forward to seeing you again live in person soon. Thank you all.